Jeremiah knew what many others did not know. Jeremiah was entrusted with one of the most challenging missions that God had ever given to one of his prophets. He was obligated to give a message that was undesirable and disagreeable. Jeremiah was considered to have the kindest heart of all the prophets, but he never held back when it came to expressing his opinions. Jeremiah, often described as the weeping prophet, was one of the major voices that spoke to the people on God's behalf under the Old Testament. Jeremiah prophesied a hundred years after Isaiah when Israel was dealing with the Assyrian Empire. At that time, the nation's enemy was Babylon. In the midst of those fermenting days of turmoil and tragedy, God called this young man. Priests and prophets had different perspectives. A priest's job was predictable, but a prophet's job was very unpredictable. A priest was paid regularly, but a prophet never knew where his money would come from. A priest was concerned with ceremony, whereas a prophet was concerned with convictions. The people were comforted by a priest, but a prophet confronted them. God often used different encounters and unusual analogies to teach him certain truths that he needed Israel to understand clearly. One such practical example is when Jeremiah was told to buy a new loincloth or waistband. This was supposed to explain the level of intimacy between the Lord and his children. This is what the Lord said to me, go and buy a linen belt and put it around your waist, but do not let it touch water. So I bought a belt as the Lord directed and put it around my waist. Jeremiah chapter 13 verses 1 and 2. Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, told Jeremiah to take a sash and tie it around himself as an object lesson. The linen sash is the first of the symbolic acts Jeremiah used to convey God's word to the people. Linen is the material used for priestly garments. Ezekiel chapter 44 verses 17 and 18. Amplified Bible. It shall be that when they enter the gates of the inner courtyard, they shall be clothed in linen garments. No wool shall be on them while they minister at the gates of the inner courtyard and within the temple. They shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen undergarments on their loins. They shall not dress themselves with anything which makes them sweat. The sash symbolizes Israel as a holy people, a kingdom of priests. Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, Amplified Bible. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation set apart for my purpose. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. The sash, as an emblem of Israel, speaks of the intimate relationship of God with his covenant people. Jeremiah chapter 13, verses 3 through 5, Amplified Bible. Then the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, Get up and take the waistband that you have bought, which is wrapped around your loins, and go to the river Euphrates, and hide it there in a crevice of the rock. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates, as the Lord had commanded me. And after many days the Lord said to me, Get up, go to the Euphrates, and get the waistband, which I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug, and I took the waistband from the place where I had hidden it. And behold, the waistband was decayed and ruined. It was completely worthless. Jeremiah chapter 13, verses 6 and 7, Amplified Bible. Jeremiah found what he might have expected. The sash had become tarnished due to the moisture and the filth. It was still physically present, but had lost all of its utility and was beyond repair. It had lost all of the majesty and distinction that it had demonstrated in the past. Where straightforward speech would have been overlooked, a few well-timed gestures captured everyone's attention and aroused their interest in the topic. To win men's hearts, we dare even risk being labeled theatrical. So please don't hold us responsible if the truth is sometimes portrayed in a more dramatic light. Jeremiah chapter 13, verses 8 through 11, Amplified Bible. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, in this same way I shall destroy the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. These wicked and malevolent people who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the stubborn way of their heart and have followed other gods, which are nothing, just man-made carvings, to serve them and to worship them, let them be just like this waistband, which is completely worthless. For as the waistband clings to the body of a man, so I cause the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to cling to me, says the Lord. 
that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. But they did not listen and obey. The noble sash was taken to the Euphrates and ruined. In the same way, Judah and Jerusalem would likewise be transported to the Euphrates and beyond in their coming captivity, and thus God would ruin the pride of his people. At one point in history, God had a significant purpose for his people in the world. Yet, because they had so thoroughly rejected God at that moment, they were no longer useful for anything. This came about as a result of their three primary transgressions. First, they refused to hear Yahweh's words. The people of God had become hard and cold towards the word of God to them. In a reading of Jeremiah, you notice a key theme, God's judgment on his people for failing to listen to or obey him. The word listen appears in the ESV translation of Jeremiah 45 times, more than in any other book of the Bible, and more than every book in the New Testament combined. For the very first page of the scriptures, we learn that our God is a God who speaks. Listening involves both hearing and doing God's word. Listening to God's true voice is essential in a world where many false voices are speaking. Refusing to listen to God is the worst kind of stubbornness. Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 12. And because you have done worse things than your fathers, just look, every one of you walks in the stubbornness of his own evil heart, so that you do not listen to me. Second, they follow the dictates of their hearts. The people of God, on the other hand, put their faith in themselves and their own understanding rather than in the Lord. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26 warns us, Those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. Third, they pursued other gods in order to worship them. When they stopped listening to God and began following their own hearts, it led them down the path to the idolatry that was so destructive to their society. Finally, sin is the answer to this question. Man's sinful nature drives us to worship modern idols, all of which are, in reality, forms of self-worship. The temptation to worship ourselves in various ways is a strong one. When we hear the word idol, we often conjure up images of statues or objects similar to those worshipped by pagans in ancient cultures. However, idols of the 21st century frequently bear no resemblance to artifacts used thousands of years ago. Many people today have replaced the golden calf with an insatiable desire for money, prestige, or success in the eyes of the rest of the world. Some people seek the approval of others as their ultimate goal. Some seek comfort or a variety of other passionate but ultimately futile pursuits. Unfortunately, our societies frequently admire those who serve such idols. In the end, however, it makes no difference what empty pleasure we pursue or what idol or false god we worship. The result is the same, separation from the one true God. Unfortunately, God is frequently pushed aside as we vigorously pursue our idols. Worse yet, the amount of time that we frequently invest in these activities that bring idolatry into our lives leave us with very little or no time to spend with the Lord. We sometimes turn to idols for solace from life's trials and tribulations, as well as the turmoil that pervades our world. Addictive behaviors such as drug or alcohol use, or even excessive reading or television viewing, can be used to temporarily escape a difficult situation or the rigors of daily life. The psalmist, on the other hand, warns us that those who put their trust in this behavior will become spiritually useless. We must put our trust in the Lord who has promised to keep us from all harm and to supply all of our needs when we put our trust in Him. We read, As the sash clings to the waist of a man, so I have caused the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to cling to me. Just as a fine sash expressed beauty and nobility, so God wanted his people to be ornaments of his greatness to the world. If they would cling to him, they would be my people for renown, for praise, and for glory. The chief purpose and ultimate goal of human beings is to be wrapped around God's waist like a fashion accessory. When we are at our very best, we adorn God with glory. Due to their persistent and stubborn disobedience toward the Lord, Judah failed to fulfill the noble and beautiful destiny that God had planned for them. As a result, they became worthless and destroyed, 
similar to the buried sash. What was true for ancient Judah is true among God's people today. God's plan is to make His people a noble ornament, a decoration of His own presence and work. If we reject this noble calling, we become useless for His highest and best purpose, and our own. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 12, Amplified Bible. Therefore you are to speak this word to them. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every jar should be filled with wine. The people will say to you, do we not already know that every jar should be filled with wine? We read, every bottle shall be filled with wine. This proverbial phrase had the sense, everything will fulfill its purpose. A bottle, actually a clay jar to hold wine, not a glass bottle, was meant to contain wine. So to say, every bottle shall be filled with wine was another way to say, everything shall fulfill its purpose or it will all be right in the end. The people's response showed their confidence in the principle of the proverb. If God had planned a noble and high purpose for Israel, surely it would be fulfilled and good times would follow. Jeremiah chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, Amplified Bible. Then say to them, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am about to fill with drunkenness all the people of this land, even the kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all the people of Jerusalem. I will smash them one against another, both the fathers and the sons together, says the Lord. I shall destroy them. Nothing will restrain me. I will not show pity, nor be sorry, nor have compassion. God's disobedient people would not fulfill their intended purpose in a noble manner, as they would be consumed by stupidity and a sense of apathy. Despite their unwavering belief in their fate as God's chosen people, the Lord aimed to shatter their fatalistic mood. Bottles not only have a destiny to be filled, they also have a destiny to be broken. God promised His rebellious people that they would face this destiny if they continued in their sin against Him. The lesson that he needed Jeremiah to sink into their hearts was the absolute necessity of clinging closely to the one who has made us his very own. It is only in God that our true worth and honor can be seen. Every other thing that we run after will eventually fill our hearts with regret. The truth is that it is not enough to have known the way of truth and the path of true life while clinging to the source of your existence in times past. It is much more important to cherish that relationship every day of your life, or soon you could sadly wake up to realize how empty you are without God. Cling to me and do not forget your source was also God's instruction to his people as they were about to enter the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 8 For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, and His decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your ancestors, as it is today. Different people in the Bible have stories that remind us to never let go of God and to never assume that we can never fall away from the truth. Through this sash, God provides a teaching analogy for His people. The ruined piece of clothing represented the people of Israel who once served and worshipped God but then became useless through their disobedience. Leaders have special reasons to pay close attention to this object lesson. Consider the parallels between leaders and the linen sash. They remain useful when they are stretched. We must be stretched and challenged. They are secure. They are solid. We must possess stable values. Leaders become useless when they are soiled. We cannot live with sin and apathy. They also become useless when they are separated. We must draw our identity from God. We cannot live as mavericks. There is a distinction between the kind of pride that God despises in Proverbs 8.13 
and the kind of pride we can feel about a job well done, or the kind of pride we express over loved ones' accomplishments. The kind of pride that stems from self-righteousness or conceit, on the other hand, is sin, and God despises it because it prevents people from seeking Him. Psalm 10.4 explains that the proud are so consumed with themselves that their thoughts are far from God. In his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. This kind of haughty pride is the opposite of the spirit of humility that God seeks. The consequences of pride are mentioned numerous times in the Bible. Many people have been deterred from accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior because of their pride. Admitting sin and admitting that we can do nothing to inherit eternal life in our own strength is a constant stumbling block for prideful people. We are not to boast about ourselves. Instead, we are to proclaim the glory of God. In God's work, what we say about ourselves is meaningless. That is why we give God the glory. He is the only one who deserves it. Every time God speaks to us, we have the choice to respond in pride or humility. We have the choice to reject or resist the word of the Lord or to humble ourselves before his authority. God warned Judah to take the humble path. Confess your sins and turn to him. Then these sore evils may be averted. We find the rest of their punishment in the next verses. Jeremiah chapter 13, verses 15 through 27, Amplified Bible. Listen and pay close attention. Do not be haughty and overconfident, for the Lord has spoken, says Jeremiah. Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness and before your feet stumble on the dark and shadowy mountains and while you are longing for light. He turns it into the shadow of death and makes it into thick darkness. But if you will not listen and obey, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and flow with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. Say to the king and the queen mother, humble yourselves and take a lowly seat, for your beautiful crown, the crown of your glory, has come down from your head. The cities of the south have been closed up, and there is no one to open them. All Judah has been carried into exile, completely carried away into exile. Lift up your eyes and see those coming from the north. Where is the flock that was given to you to shepherd? your beautiful flock. What will you say, O Jerusalem, when the Lord appoints foreign nations to rule over you? Those former friends and allies who you have encouraged to be your companions, will not pain seize you like that of a woman in childbirth? And if you wonder and say in your heart, why have these things happened to me? It is because of the greatness and nature of your sin, that your skirts have been pulled away, subjecting you to public disgrace, and like a barefoot slave, your heels have been wounded. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then you also can do good, who are accustomed to evil and even trained to do it. Therefore I will scatter you like drifting straw, driven away by the desert wind. This is your destiny, the portion of judgment measured to you from me, says the Lord, because you have forgotten me and trusted in pagan lies, the counterfeit gods, and the pretense of alliance. So I myself will throw your skirts up over your face, that your shame may be exposed. I have seen your vile and detestable acts, even your adulteries and your lusting knaves, and the lewdness of your prostitution on the hills in the fields. Woe to you, O Jerusalem! How long will you remain unclean? 